Bibles out, and we're going to be turning to the Old Testament book of Nahum. The Old Testament book of Nahum. There's only uh, three chapters uh, that's accredited to our prophet, and uh, we're going to take them one chapter at a time over the next uh, few weeks. And there is an outline in your bulletin for you that if you'll take your pen and you can kind of follow along with us and put your own notes in there that you can use when you uh, get home this, and this week, you can go, just go back over it and work it out. Nahum, I would dare say if I took a poll this morning that this is not, this is not one of those books that... Um, that you have memorized. Uh, I've never seen it at the top of anybody's uh, favorite list or anything like that. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's the Word of God though. And Nahum had a message for the people of Nineveh. What I need to do, Todd? It didn't bother me. I'll stand two feet back from the podium. How about that? Just don't move. Uh, let's see if we can do that. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of background so that you will be familiar with the book. Um, there are two books of the Bible that were written to the city of Nineveh. Now you're familiar with the book of Jonah. Jonah is a prophet who was sent to the city of Nineveh, which is an Assyrian. Assyrian city, it's hard not to breathe, Todd. Assyrian city, and um, he preached to them a message of repentance. He told them to repent, and he didn't really want them to, but the Holy Spirit came upon the city of Nineveh, and a great revival, a great evangelistic crusade occurred there. He simply, I wish you could do this today. He simply walked through the town on Main Street, told them that they were all going to burn if they didn't turn, basically. And people just, the Holy Spirit came upon that town and people just got saved everywhere. And he went out, sat under a, a little, uh, little bush and got mad and because God was saving those people. God was giving them a second chance. Well, Nahum comes along 150 years later, and he's preaching to the same city. He's not preaching repentance to them. He's telling them that because they have rejected God, that God is about to judge them. That God is going, has given them 150 years to get things right, and they have not. They've rejected God. And so punishment is going to come upon them. Now, time had ran out for them. So we look at this book and we have to say, what's in it for you and I today? Well, to start with, I want you to understand that God is just. And we've entitled this message, God is Just. Because God sent them a messenger named Jonah. He preaches the gospel they accept it, and then they turn away. God gives them 150 years to get things right, and they do not. And so God comes, and instead of forgiving them their sins, God has to come and, and punish them for their sins. They had become the most wicked nation in the world. We'll get to chapter 3, and it will have a verse in it that speaks about them fighting with the Egyptians and they literally took their children, and it says they dashed their children against a stone. That's how wicked these people had become. And God said, because you will not turn, I am going to have to judge you. Now, when I see this passage, I think about America today. We are a nation that God founded that God brought about. We are a nation that has preached the gospel around the world, and yet we are a nation that has constantly walked away from God. We are a nation that has 
giving up our foundation, as, I, as we should say. We're a nation that God is being patient with right now. A nation that God is calling to himself right now. But I think we as Americans need to understand that God is just. And that just as God has blessed us, God can come along and God can judge us for our sins. So in this first chapter, Nahum tells us some very important information about God. In a sense, he is reminding the people of Nineveh about who God is before the judgment comes. And I think you and I, I think the church in America today is going to have to bear the judgment for where America is today. Uh, I don't put my trust in our government. I don't put my trust in the business world of America. Uh, I have, I'm actually a very, I had a very freeing moment uh, when it came to the point where it no longer bothered me who was president of the United States. Um, the guy we got, I didn't vote for him either, either time. I have no problem saying that. I, I didn't because I didn't think he was the right man for the job. And I have no problem with that. I'd tell him that to his face. But I, it doesn't bother me any longer because I have come to the point to realize that it doesn't matter who sits in the Oval Office, God is still God. And they cannot take him off of his throne. And I think that God was trying to bring these people to the same place that they would put their trust not in their military power, not in their, their king, not in, in their might or their riches, but that they would put their trust in God. And I think the church today needs to do the very same thing. So let's pick up in this chapter. The first six verses go together, and so I want to read them together. And I want us to see that God is telling the people. And remember, this is written, and they're reading it to the Israelites. And they're also carrying the message to Nineveh. But this is a message that is really for the people of Israel. He says, this is the burden against Nineveh. This is the oracle, the prophecy. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Now, wouldn't you like to have that attached to you? God is jealous, he says, and the Lord avenges. He, he makes his statement right up front. We have no, no confusion about where Nahum is going. God loves, and yet God must be just in all that he does. His love cannot outweigh his justice, and his justice cannot undermine his love. He says God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges, and the Lord is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and he makes it dry. And dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. And the flower of Lebanon wilts, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt. And the earth heaves at his presence, yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Verse 6, who, who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Uh, that's a fearful statement that he makes here. But he lets us know in this passage at the very beginning, God says that I love you. I love you, he says. And we read from the beginning of the Bible to the end of it, and we find 
that God is love. We see Him responding to us. We see Him reaching out to us. And it's always in love. He, if He chastises us, if He corrects us, it's because He loves us. God has always dealt with us out of His abundant love, and He will continue to deal with us out of His abundant love. But the passage tells us a couple of things, and it first tells us that God is very slow to anger. It takes Him 150 years to get to the point to where He tells Nineveh, I'm going to destroy you. And by the way, He does destroy Nineveh. They only unearthed it about 150 years ago. 100 to 150 years ago, they found the ruins. Many people thought for centuries that Nineveh was a made-up city in the Bible until they found the ruins. God totally destroyed Nineveh, and Nineveh goes back before recorded history. It was always, when they first start writing history, Nineveh was a town. It was solid. It was always there. It always sat on the Tigris. Nobody could do away with it until their sin came up before God and God in His justice wiped it away. People think today that these nations will always be here. That America will always be here. That these other countries will, and governments will always be there. I want you to know that God loves us with all of His heart but that God is just, and He is very slow to anger. But when His anger comes, God will judge. The majority of these verses have to deal with God's ability to judge. They talk about God walking in the, on the clouds. It talks about God coming and, and the, drying up the sea and the rivers. And when He speaks about Carmel and Bashan, they were two agricultural areas. It's where the crops grew. It's where the vegetable gardens grew. It's where the olive trees were. He talks about Lebanon where the great cedars were. These were abundant areas and they supplied food for a vast uh, area in the Middle East there. They were a place that flowed with milk and honey, we would say. And God says in His Word, when I step on the scene, everything fades away in judgment. All the richness goes away. The bank accounts swivel up and dry up and are no more. The businesses come to a halt. The everyday activity ceases. The things that we once took for granted are not there any longer. God says, I have the power to stop the supermarkets from running. I have the power to shut down Walmart. God said, I can bring it to where it's nothing but a barren land simply by my presence. He is letting Israel know, because Israel's on the bottom right here. They're the slaves. They're the indentured servants. They're the ones that are not getting their way. And he lets them know that in his great power that he's able to destroy and he's also able to lift up. This passage, though, speaks to us about the fact that God is patient with sinners. And I think it's the greatest piece of these first few verses. Yes, God is love. Yes, God judges. And God judges totally in complete power. God can annihilate an entire city. He can literally cover it with sand and dirt if he so chooses. And that's what he did to Nineveh. But the great message here for you and I is that God is patient with sinners. And it makes you and I want to stop and look at our own lives and realize that our time is running out. Because you see, we have those sins that we keep hidden in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. Those sins that we only uh, let out when we're around certain people or when we're by ourselves. We have those sins that we keep hidden that we think that God doesn't even know about. Well, I, you know, nobody was here, so I just erased the browser on the computer, and so nobody can go back and see what I was looking at. We do those type things, and we know it. I don't have to have you nod your head. We tell things to one person and we know that they're a lie. We're just trying to get them off of our backs or get them off the phone. 
We do all numbers of things and yet God speaks to us and says, I want your life to be righteous and holy. And God is being patient with you and I. God's being patient with the church in America today. I have folks ask me, I hear great things going on in other countries in their churches. Why isn't it happening in America? I think it's very simple. It's because sin has so entered into the church today that the church has become another business in America. The church pumps billions of dollars through it right now. And we're going to see a day where our government's going to start taxing the church because of all the billions of dollars of revenue they're losing by giving us tax-exempt status. They would rather that money go through a taxed business so that they could gleam from it. The church will eventually in America be like the churches around the world. It will become part of the government. And the government will tell it what it can and cannot say and will dictate all that it does. The church must... If it wants to survive as God's people, must open its eyes and realize that sin is all around us. That destruction is all around us. That God is crying out to the church today, I love you, but I am just. And if the church doesn't turn back to God, then judgment day is coming. We are no better than Nineveh. God loved the Ninevites just as much as he loves us today. And it is on the shoulders of the church to carry the greatest message in the world to the world. And that is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nahum brings a very brazen message to Israel. And Israel will carry it on to Nineveh. But God says, not only do I love you, but he makes them a promise when we get to verses 7 through 11. Remember, God is our Father. And God loves us. But he picks up in verse 7 and says, The Lord is good. He's just told us about the great power of God and how he can destroy this world simply with one word. And he turns to verse 7 and says, But I want you to know that the Lord is not mean. He's not arrogant. He's not prideful. But the Lord is good. And he's good to you and I. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. He implies that trouble is going to come. And he knows those who trust in him. He begins by telling us that we can take refuge in God and in God only. Take refuge in God. The passage deals a great deal with trust. Who have you put your trust in today? Who are you trusting for your future? Who are you trusting for your livelihood? He says in verse 8, but with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. And darkness will pursue his enemies. God is protecting Israel and he's chasing the enemies away. And what you do, what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns, this is an interesting passage, while tangled like thorns, and you know how thorns can wrap up, and while drunken like drunkards who stagger everywhere, talking about their enemies, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, A wicked counselor. It's interesting that here the enemy is called a wicked counselor. And we'll get to the New Testament and Jesus is called wonderful counselor. Prince of God. So we see two opposites here that God is speaking about. And God says I'm going to destroy the wicked. Whether they are people in Israel or whether they are people in Nineveh. I am going... To let the wickedness of the wicked come upon them. And they shall reap the consequences of their own actions. God says, I'm simply been protecting you from your own wickedness so far. I've been holding back what you really deserve because of the sin that you are committing. 
And so I am the God who protects. There's not a one of us in this room that would probably still be alive this morning if God had not protected us in spite of our sinfulness. There's everybody in this room at some time has been somewhere doing something we shouldn't have done. We've gotten into an automobile. We've been in a situation and it was only by the grace of God that we are sitting here today. Some of us may have woke up on Sunday morning and said, it's by the grace of God I am where I am if I just knew where I am this morning. Because I don't know what went on last night. We've heard people tell those stories time and time again. I woke up Sunday morning and my car was sitting in a ditch from a drunk, drunken stupor on Saturday night. I don't know how I got there or what went on, but... There must have been an angel of the Lord who stepped in and drove me into the ditch to protect me. There's no telling what would have happened to us in our lives if it wasn't for a protecting God who has watched over our little bitty children, who playing in the yard, who close to the street. And the list could go on and on. Our minds could reel with events where we've grabbed up our child and said, thank God there was not a car coming down the road. Thank God the neighbor's dog was not, not out in his yard. Thank God that the, the snake was this or there. I remember my grandfather one time uh, was walking out in the yard and, and stepped, literally stepped on a rattlesnake that was walking, going through his yard. <laughs> and we asked him what he did. He said he stood there and called for grandmother. <laughs> Bring me something. How many times have we been so close to death and death would have clasped its hands around us had it not been for protecting God? Who won the battles that our nation brags about? Was it us or was it a God who protects us? Our list could go on and on and God is reminding the nation of Israel, I love you with all my heart and I will protect you and I will destroy the wicked. God has to remind us that He is always the hero who rescues us. We like to paint pictures of great men and women through the Bible and down through the ages. But when it comes down to the bottom line, it's really God who is the hero. It's God who took 300 men with torches and trumpets and defeated the Midianites. We give the credit to Gideon, but all Gideon did was blow a trumpet and hold up a light. I mean, how, how, much, how little can you do to defeat an entire army? We like to talk about the greatness of the Israelite armies, but all they did was march around the city and blow a horn and the walls fell down. I mean, good gracious, we can look over and over again at the battles throughout the world, throughout the centuries. And we find that it is God who is the hero. It is God who has done the protecting. It's God that has done the rescuing. It is God that has remained faithful to Himself. You see, He's just. He loves us, yes. He protects us, yes. But He's a just God. And He always does that which is right. The last part of this chapter, though, deals with the promise that God says, I will deliver you. I, I will. You see, God is still our shepherd. David would write those famous words, and he would say that, that the Lord is my shepherd. And Nahum will look back and read those psalms and remember that it's God that delivers us. Pick up with me in verse 12. He says, thus says the Lord. Therefore, this is what God says. Because God loves us and God is all powerful and God is the one who's protected us all along. Therefore, God has a message that he would like to say to us. He's reminded us of God's greatness and of God's justice. He says this is what God has to say. Though they are safe, and though they are likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. How? When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. 
You see, God had used the Assyrians, the Ninevites, to come down to Israel. And he had used them to judge Israel because Israel had turned to false idols. They had put their trust in their money. They had put their trust in their land. They had put their trust in their businesses. They had put their trust in their own selves. And God was pushed aside. The worship of God was, I just don't have time today. And that's not the way we do business. And so God was shoved aside. And God had used the Assyrians to take away everything that the Israelites had put their trust in. They were no longer rich. They no longer possess their own land. Somebody else could tell them what to do or move them around. They no longer could control their own businesses. The Assyrians could come at any time and kill as many of them as they wanted. They were at the Assyrians' mercy. And God says, listen, I am going to pass through the Assyrian camp, the country there, the town of Nineveh. And though I have used them to afflict you and to bring you back to me, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to turn my judgment upon your enemy. He says in verse 13, For now I will break off his yoke. I'm going to break the hold that Assyria has on you. And I will burst your bonds apart. There'll be no more. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods I will cut off the carved image and the molded image and I will dig your grave. That's pretty vivid language, isn't it? I will dig your grave for you are, what does he say? Vile. You are contemptible. You're vile. I mean, that's not a word we sling around too much today. But when we do hear it, it kind of gives us the heebie-jeebies. I'm vile. And this is God telling us, telling the Assyrians, you're a bunch of vile people, a bunch of wicked people. You're the lowest of the low. And therefore, I am going to dig your grave, and I'm going to put you in it. This passage is telling us this morning that only God can deliver us. That's the reason I I really give up on putting any trust in our government system or our United Nations or the world powers that are floating around. I realize that the prince of the power there, that Satan himself is in control of them. He even offered them to Jesus, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I am reminded that only God can deliver you and me. He's our only hope. And I have come to realize from reading Nahum that it is God who destroys the nations. And if ISIS is going to be destroyed, it's going to have to be the hand of God. And if the terrorist movements around the world and the wickedness, if the abortion movement that goes on in our world, if the slave trade that goes on in our world, if any of that's going to be destroyed because there's so much money made in it, If it's going to be destroyed, it's going to have to take the hand of God to bring it to its destruction. It brings us to the point of realizing that only God can help us. We have plenty of self-help books, but my friends, the bottom line is that only God can help us. Let's finish. We're not going to leave, leave us just talking about the vile Assyrians because it's also a reference to anybody that is wicked and refuses to to listen to God, we are just as vile as the Assyrians are. He says in verse 15, Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings. Now isn't that a wonderful verse to put in there? He tells you and I this morning to sit up, to wake up, and to think for just a moment. On the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings. The feet of him who proclaims peace. Isn't that what we want in our lives? On our jobs? In our relationships with our neighbors and our families? Wouldn't we just like to have peace at one holiday meal? Wouldn't we like to have peace at one birthday party? Wouldn't we like to have peace at one day on the job? 
O Judah, he's speaking to the Israelites, keep your appointed feast. You need to worship the Lord, he is saying. Perform your vows. Go to church. Teach your Sunday school classes. Pray. Read your Bible. For the wicked one shall no more pass through you. God says, I'm going to cut off these Assyrians. They won't be showing up at your back door anymore. He is utterly cut off. Now the whole question here of verse 15 is, Judah, are you willing to trust me? That's the question that they had to answer that day. Let's read it again. And you, you, you listen to it with the understanding of that question. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Are you willing to trust what I'm saying to you? Are you willing to trust me? And the question arises, can you and I trust God today? And we would raise our hands and say, yes, we're all sitting in a church, so we have to raise our hands and say, yes, I can trust God today. And God takes us one step closer to Him. And He says, well, are you trusting me today? And we say, well, Lord, we didn't want you to get that personal. We're in a congregation. Can't we stick to congregational questions? I didn't know we were going to talk about ourselves individually. But God is always an individual God. He always is interested in you individually. You as a person. And God says, are you trusting me? It's, it's a very deep question for you and I to answer this morning. And we can flip it off very lightly and say, oh yes, I trust God every day of my life, you know. I get up every morning and say, thank you Lord for a good night's rest. And every night I say, thank you Lord for a good day. I trust God all the time. So you ask Him what you should do. Well, you know, preacher, I'm... I'm 50 years old, I pretty much know what to do. Well, right there is where our problem is. It doesn't matter if you're 150 years old, you probably still don't know what to do. If you're like me, we need to be asking the Lord, what would you have me to do? Because you see, if I already have my mind made up, I'm, I know I'm not trusting God at all. I'm trusting in myself. And you remember, I'm the one that's made all of those dumb mistakes in my life. Nobody else made those dumb mistakes in my life. Nobody else ma committed those sins. It was all me. It was all my decision. It was all of my choosing. So I don't have a great track record when I look at my life according to God. When I look at it from His perspective, when I look at my life through His eyes, I've got a pretty, a pretty dismal life, a pretty bad record of being able to make the right choices. And then I look at those few times when I have asked him, what would you have me to do? And I trusted him. And I find that that's always the times that I did that which was right. And I had peace about it. The nation of Israel has been in bondage. They've been beaten down. They've been de literally destroyed. They have no strength to get up. And God comes along and says, I want you all to know that I still love you. Church, God loves you today. The church has been battered over these last few years. The church has been beat down. We have a bad reputation. We're being told now that, that we hate gays and we hate every type of person there is out there. We've been called the most racist group in the world because we preach the Ten Commandments and stuff like that. The church has a bad rap today. We've been told that we just don't quite measure up. Israel was having a bad day. And God is saying to you and I as the church today the same thing he said to Israel. I want to know, are you willing to trust me today? Because I love you. 
And I protect you. And I deliver you. I'm the only one who can. I think we need to go home today and be very serious with God in a very quiet room and ask God, God, am I actually trusting you? And if I'm not, then Lord, I don't want to live in this distrust any longer. I want to live a life where I trust you. It's, it's, some people call it a life of faith. Some people call it walking with the Lord. But it's trusting God with my everyday life, with what goes on today. Heavenly Father, have I trusted you this morning? It's a very personal question. It was very personal to Israel. And it's very personal to you and me this morning. We can continue to live just like we're living and we will continue to get the same thing and it will only get worse. Or we can turn to God. We can put our trust in Him. A God who loves us. A God who will protect us. And a God who will deliver us. The choice is ours today as it's been every day of our lives. This is just a reminder to you that God can be trusted today. I want to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. I want you to bow your heads and I want us to go.